fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Jason Gleaves. Now he's uh, recently wrote a book, The UFOlogy Umbrella, and it's Close Encounters Are Not Enough. So uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today, Jason. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for the invite. So, Jason, first of all, how did you get involved in UFOs? Um, Well, really, it started when I was young, um, about the age of seven, when I had uh, my first uh, encounter or sighting with my sister, age seven, in Liverpool. And um, we were basically basically playing upstairs as young kids do and and uh, a bright illuminated disc shaped craft appeared outside the window of the upstairs window of the bedroom uh, which we both looked at you know you could look at the it was a bright illuminated light which you could actually look at without hurting your eyes um, and then it took off at high velocity and then we carried on playing as if nothing had happened um, and I'd basically forgotten about it, really, until only a few years back when I started getting into uh, ufology in general more, in more depth, and my sister reminded me of it. Um, but other than that, really, I've always been interested in science fiction as a youngster, a bit like anybody else, watching Doctor Who and Star Wars and all the sci-fi programs that I could watch. And um, I, I sort of led on really watching the likes of um, Arthur C. Clarke had a, a, br- a fantastic TV show out, uh, Mysterial, Mysterious Worlds, I think it was called. And again, again, I just read books on it, on ufology, and got the magazines like everybody else. And, you know, it sort of went on from there, really. So, uh, but uh, now this book in itself, why why did you write this book? Like, what is it that you hope people get from the book when they read it? Yeah, well, this book, really, it, it stemmed from the first book which I wrote, which was um, UFO Photo, where I actually analyze photographs of people all around the world who contact me who have it experiences and sightings and footage and they would need it analyzing or someone to explain what they're actually seeing um and this second book really was a uh, the next stage on from that because i really wanted to get I, i've always been asked a lot of questions about ufology and i you know basically trying to get out answers to people a bit like myself you know i started asking a lot of questions earlier on in my journey in ufology and you know it's the same with everybody else really and this book now the ufology umbrella is really the next stage where i try to explain uh, close encounters to people because um, a lot of people i say a lot of people well people don't realize that there are seven separate categories of close encounters so it's, it's a sort of a diy approach to ufology where people can basically pick it up and and get into the basics of you know ufology in general so jason tell me a little bit about how you developed your your, um industry years ago really that you decided to get into it a little bit more and your your sister reminded you of your own experience so that's that's quite a short space of time so how have you developed your understanding um well again like i said it's my sort of natural progression my my own journey as i said um and it it led on really i had um, an experience uh, when i was in the air force when i served in the royal air force at raf cosford 
Um, there was um, an incident happened there where uh, a huge triangular shaped uh, uh, craft uh, descended down over the base um, and it was seen by the on duty guard uh, posts at the airfield and obviously the guard commander and, and the military police saw it and the day after uh, Nick Pope who worked in the Ministry of Defence at the time at Whitehall actually investigated the case and you know, investigated it in more depth and he even mentioned when he interviewed the young airman who saw the initial craft over the, the, the base itself um, he was still trembling he said the next day after when he was interviewing him but on the same night this was in March 93 um, people throughout the UK also saw similar shaped craft throughout the UK you know dark black uh, triangular shaped craft and they were seen by on duty policemen and other members of the public um, after the craft left RAF Cosford it then flew on to another RAF base which was nearby which was um, RAF Shawbury and it was seen by the on duty air traffic controller uh, and they, he saw a, a craft of similar description whether it actually came from Cosford and went on there you know we're just assuming but you know it was a similar description and it was firing laser thin pencil like lasers down towards the ground and his impre impression of the the site in at Shawbury was that this object was looking for something Hmm. Uh, now, how do we know that it was uh, like uh, from another planet, or if it could be some secret ship by a government, like you know, Russia or U.S. or even England? Yeah. Well, well, we don't know. That's that's the thing. Um, it was seen by a lot of people, but the only thing I could really say is. Um, it was nothing that we had in our, you know, um, our aircraft types in the air, in the Royal Air Force at that time. You know, we had tornadoes and Jaguars and Harriers and Hawks and all different types of aircraft are similar, but it was nothing like we had at the time. So it could have been possibly a secret covert craft. Um, again, you know, speculation um, and Nick his investigation as well afterwards um he, he sort of said the same thing really that we you know we didn't know what it was or its origin especially and that's the important thing for our listeners isn't it jason that the unidentified flying object is just that it's, it doesn't mean it's an alien life form it means that we're seeing something that we don't understand or that's we it. don't have a um a definitive um name for yeah so when when you talk about the the craft going from cosford to shawbury what, the t what, what was the timing difference it was roughly about um i can't remember the exact time but it was within you know a time scale of the first sighting to the second and obviously the other sightings throughout the uk were all prior to the raf cosford so you know you could sort of, you could actually probably put um, uh, a, you know a map and, and track the locations on that night where it was seen. Um, but again, you know, it, 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 UFO, like you've just said, is unidentified flying object. And I think over years, people have mischanged the you know the definition of that actual UFO which you just said, unidentified flying object, when, you know, it's not, you know, it's, um, it, it is what it says. It doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. It's literally unidentified. And and most governments and, and uh, military have their own drones or different information gathering aircraft that um, the layperson wouldn't know about and they wouldn't recognise. So that that is a possibility when it's going over Air Force bases. In terms mm -hmm. of um, in terms of your, I suppose your your take on UFOs. What what's your view on them? Would you fall more into extraterrestrial? Would you or would you not? 
I would say it's pretty even keel, really. Um, the actual images I get from people from all around the world, and again, when I actually analyse the photographs and, you know, um, try to determine what the object is that they're seeing, you know, a lot of the time there are misidentified birds, uh, aircraft especially, and weather phenomena, you know, around, depending where they live, location, etc. Um, but there is a small, you know, uh, min- not minute, but there is a small percentage of images that are unidentified. Um, I do a lot of image analysis for uh, good friends of mine, um, James Gilliland and uh, Peter Maxwell Slattery from the SETI Ranch, and they've had fantastic images from there you know for sightings of beings craft orbs in the sky and many people go to the ranch to see these you know aerial objects that fly over because it's such a a ufo hot spot but there are also you know sightings of aircraft and military aircraft and also you know you have to look for the telltale signs of objects that are seen in the sky because you know you look for the strobe lights on aircraft with that all aircraft worldwide have to have through you know civilian and military aviation law and you get landing lights etc and the different colored tip lights on the wing tips there are a lot of factors but especially at the ranch you the, the a lot of the craft that you see there you know you can see them power up power down and when you analyse the footage in real depth, you can see other objects around orbs. And, you know, I I'd advise anybody to go to their websites and, and look at all the data that they've got there. Does, um, if you don't mind me asking, what was your role in the RAF? Uh, I was carpenter first and then uh, remustered later to aircraft finisher. Okay, so so your your analysis, your ability to analyse these um, photos or, or pictures, doesn't mm-hmm. come from a, a, an expertise in that field. Uh, no, it, that? I've been sort of mainly self-taught. I've always um, had computers and you know with programs, etc., and used the the Photoshop and things like that. And when I say use Photoshop, it's not to change the actual images. It's really to use the filters to enhance the photographs, like you can invert them or use coloured filters. And it brings out, you know, more detail in the photographs. And it's like I said, it really stemmed. One thing led to another. And, you know, setting up the Facebook page, UF only and Twitter, etc., and it just seemed to snowball and, and get into that side. And again, it stems really back to my journey through ufology with experiences and things that have happened to myself. And I just wanted to, you know, give out really the information that I'd found on my journey. We've um, interviewed lots of people um, who are very interested in UFOs and, and some who feel that they have been abducted by them. Um, Do you believe in alien abduction? Yes, yeah, I do. Um, And again, with cases that I've uh, analysed of, not necessarily of images, but accounts and people that have come to me looking for advice. And, you know, I I could help them the best way I can, but if I don't know, you know, a way of helping them, I certainly know people in the ufology community that can help them. but with the cases themselves, with abduction, it's 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 quite often you'll get very similar accounts from people all around the world that haven't met each other, have been abducted and you know left with body marks etc on their body and missing time and all the related things that do come with um, abduction as such, and which is I I do believe it's not always to do with um, ET or extraterrestrial abduction, you know, it could be military, my lab, or, and you know, down that road as well. It's, it's a fascinating subject, isn't it? Because it's just so big, and, and actually there is 
there is no evidence base for it other than um, people's accounts. And yep. we know that people's accounts, whilst you know, absolutely could be true, we also know that more people are likely to report the same or very similar experiences because that's how they're believable. Yeah. So what, when you're offering an analysis, what is it about a story that makes you feel that it is a credible story from somebody who has experienced an abduction, no matter what, what that means, whether it be extraterrestrial or otherwise? Well, really, if, uh, mainly I will do um, imagery uh, anal analysis for people. So they've taken photographs and video of of images of of craft that they you know that they believe is you know to be unidentified to them and you can go down the road of checking you know about the person you can do a little bit of background research of the location and then you look for other airfields or the military installations nearby and you narrow down the field really so you you know you're getting down to trying to eliminate things in that respect, I mean, there was one case that I did cover that was given to me by Philip Mantle, who's a, another British um, ufologist, you know, and Philip's been around a long time in this field, very, um, you know, highly regarded. And he sends me quite a few images, but this one anyway was of, um, it was taken by a civilian, a Brazilian airline pilot, who was in the UK in Wiltshire on holiday, and he was taking the usual scenic photographs. And the two images Philip sent me was one of it looked initial when you first look at it. It looks like a disc-shaped object in the lower part of the screen in the sky. Um, and when I looked at it straight away, I could tell it was a military jet because it was one of similar type a tornado that I used to actually work on in the Air Force. So. But the other, the second image showed a central flagpole with a Union Jack on, and either side of the Union Jack in the sky, you could see two disc-shaped objects below. And when you look at the image, you instantly you could see all these images in the book as well. But you could see for yourself they do look like disc-shaped objects. But when I did the usual anal analysis of the photograph, went into depth. And basically, you could see there were two military jets again, but it was one jet flying away and another jet that was circling around, and I think it was a US jet. Um, but first impression was straight away, you can see the image, and they did look like disc-shaped objects. Again, you know, the, the pilot, like any pilot, is a highly trained person. And, you know, they are trained to observe the surroundings and everything else. So, you know, it's very easy to misidentify things when you, you know, get into it. So I, I, I suppose I'm still left pondering a little bit about, so if I came to you tomorrow and I said, Jason, I've had this, this really mad experience and um, I went out for a walk late last night and I... When, by the time I got back home, it, hours had passed, and I have no idea how. I saw some lights in the sky, hours then passed, and I've got this, these marks on, on my, my uh, just above my knee, on my thigh, that weren't there before. Mm -hmm. I think I've been abducted. Where, where would your starting point be? You would, like I said, you basically, you know, try to interview the person if you can and gather as much information as you can on the person, on the location. You basically, you go to work like Sherlock Holmes. You'll just, you know, gather photographic proof. Uh, again, you would also, if they've seen objects, you would look at tracking ranges of radar. Um, you would try and look to see if there have been any satellites that have gone over. You know, you can get free apps available. Uh, I think Heavens Above is one where it's very good to give you. You can actually put a date and a time in and a location, and it will give you if there have been any satellites that have flown over that location at the time. So th th there are a lot of tools out there to help 
anybody really, not just me, but anybody that is going down that road. Um, but again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not medical in that respect. So you know, you know, there'll be other people that could actually approach those sort of things better than I could. Um, my main area is the ana- analyzing of the images, really. And and I, it would be fair to say though, and I, and I don't mean sound critical because um, I, I'm not a disbeliever at all. But mm-hmm. I but I it is fair to say that there will be aircrafts out there that we have no understanding of um, that and, and uh, that would potentially we could never rule in or out extraterrestrial oh. existence. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said though. Um, I, I believe, I mean, a lot of people see the triangle-shaped craft, obviously, and there are so many different shaped craft around. You know, you can get your, your disc-shaped craft, you know. And again, it, it t- tend to go through decades of people seeing that type of craft, which does make you actually go towards or lean towards um, craft that are going through their, you know, aviation life which aircraft yes, yeah. do um so you can't rule that out of course you can't rule that out you know but you, you can get elongated cylindrical shaped you know the cigar shaped rod shapes uh circular oval elliptical that you know every sort of shape and form that you, you know people have taken photographs of them um but you know with with, with the triangular shape which is generally seen they are still being seen but they were generally seen around the 90s um i, I i'm sure well 90 percent of triangular shaped craft are probably are you know some sort of deep Vulcan. covert project yeah oh, 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 oh and we did have triangle shaped craft almost at that point as well the vulcan yeah yeah so 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 lots of um possibilities i i guess well you've got you've got you've got the the um the vulcan but then you've also got slightly on from there i was involved in the first gulf war uh desert storm um and the first time i saw the f-17 stealth bomber was during the war itself and that was distinctly triangular shaped as well so yes yeah definitely yeah so that's that's right. Actually, and that's a, you know slight. Well, was that slightly just after that time, early nineties? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So going forward, let's think about this forward with your your career now. I'm, I'm guessing you've left the RAF. Yeah. And um, and is this your main role? Is this is this what you do now for a living? No, no. I've I've got a job where um, that is my main breadwinner sort of thing, and this is what I do on the side but to be honest it's it takes virtually most of my time up so you know i I try try to get to as many conferences as i can and and fitting them in around you know you try and take holiday and things like that and and traveling to the events so yeah so where whereabouts in the uk do you get most of your um queries from all over really you, you i can't really pinpoint a location there are certain locations within the uk that are more ufo hotspot than others you know you've got land no north wales that's a, a a real hotspot for seeing objects unidentified but then you've got ref valley out that way you know on the coast of anglesey um generally throughout you'll see ufos literally everywhere you know it there's not a one look saying that in america you know you've got the seti ranch that that's you know and mount shasta and all these big areas where people seem to be drawn to the the places to see craft as well but yeah i i really would say that there's no real set place for seeing you know you could go in your own garden and see craft at night you know and what's your where's your interest like is it within the states and because it, culturally that's very different the whole ufology and 
alien abduction and extraterrestrials that that is very is presented very differently in the states and this show goes out you know obviously everywhere online but predominantly <laughs> in uh, uh, you know on, on major stations in, in the states yeah. and our audience and those that we interview in in the states are very different in how they believe and depict ufos to our, our british culture so where does your where, where who do you prefer liaising with in terms of ufos where, where would you prefer the us or the uk I couldn't say either, you know, I, and I, I wouldn't even say just the US or the UK. I've got friends, Japan, Brazil, Mexico, and especially Mexico, the, you know, the UFO sightings over there, they actually get broadcast on mainstream media, not not like here in the UK. Mm. Um, I mean, I Very know things... Culturally. Very yeah. culturally. And things are changing, you know, because I do believe disclosure is coming. And I do believe things are, you know, are, are very close to being released. And especially with the To The Stars Academy, um, with Tom DeLonge and um, Hal Putoff, you know, and Elizondo, all those people involved, you know, and there are lo they've got a lot of uh, witnesses who've worked on the aircraft carriers that saw the Tic Tac, UFOs, the pilots, etc. So, you know, and also with uh, President Trump being briefed on UFOs, and it, it it's definitely moving in the right direction, and things are changing with people worldwide appear, appearing more to be waking up to what is happening around, not just in the UK, but worldwide, you know. Mm -hmm. So now, <clears throat> so you sort of think that there there's government people now that already know that um, UFOs have visit, visited us. Yeah, yeah, you know, what is actually being sort of, uh, put out there, really, it's just through the To The Stars Academy. You know, I, like I said, I, be I believe disclosure's coming, and, but I do also believe the way it's been done, the drip feed effect, so the slowly releasing videos and, and things like that. But I do say... Um, one thing that did stand out with the the military side of it, with the uh, the gun footage they called it on the Tic Tac UFO. If you see the footage on the HUD display, you've got the altitude and the speed of the pilot with, with the UFO within sight. But down the right hand side of the actual screen, you can see the word "slave" wrote. Now. Me being ex-military, another word for slave in military terms is drone. So there, there was one little thing that I wasn't sort of quite with when I first saw it, you know. And and a lot of people are sitting on the fence because they're still waiting for more information to come out. So, you know, but I do believe it's going in the right direction. What do you do when you get a fake, when you get a hoax? when you get something that you've um, got in picture or video that uh, you find out it's not not what it seems to be? Uh, I'll, I'll actually show people what I've found, you know, the findings, the way I've analysed the image and the, what I've actually, you know, put out. The, the, I've got my first public talk coming up in November and my talk will be about analysing UFO photos and and I actually do a section in the talk uh, where I'll show people, f not fakes, but misidentifications. Um, and one famous one that I can recall, especially coming through as a youngster, looking at books and, you know, it was taken by one of the astronauts uh, of Apollo 13, I think it might have been, or 12 or 13, I can't remember the top of my head. And it was... Of a, it looked, all intents and purposes, of uh, an authentic UFO, if you want to call it that. And for years, I thought it was one of the best photographs I'd seen. And I don't know why. I just thought I would analyse this actual image and find the original NASA image of this UFO, so I could look for myself. Um, and when I actually looked more into depth, I couldn't find the original 
NASA registration number, you know, for that photograph. That was being recalled by everybody else. So I went through other... I actually sat down with the catalogue of the other NASA photographs and went through and found this image. And it, in the end, it turned out to be a misidentification of one of the uh, third stage rocket booster which had been jettisoned and it was in space next to the other capsule and photograph but with the angle it was set at it looked like a UFO at the top and that's what it was so I actually broke it down and I think I did an article for it initially for the um, Outer Limits magazine here in the UK it's run by uh, Chris Evers and I actually broke it down image by image and overlaid the image with the original UFO image, and it was an identical match. So, you know, that there are fakes out there as well with people trying to make money over, you know, getting clickbait and things like that on YouTube. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, really, because, you know, you're getting into the realms of Photoshop and editing and things like that. And sometimes, you know, you do your best to try and determine what the image is, and you, you, you can only do your best with what you've got to, to do it with. Right. Now, now it also says in the book description that you uh, cover some of the old historical UFO cases um, is, and, and you, you're basically uh, using modern, up-to-date analysis techniques on them. So um, what, what does that do? Uh, do you discover more things, uh, see more things, or what is it that you, um, you can tell us about uh, taking old cases and re reanalyzing them? Yeah, like, like I said, you know, using Photoshop, it's not about when people hear the hear the words Photoshop, they think you're actually changing the initial image. But what you're using it for, like I said, is to uh, enhance or to invert um, and to actually change the what what you're seeing on the um, the image itself. So you can go back to the old. Um, images sort of the 35 mil so it's pre-digital um and you're basically looking for um you know how authentic it is you know people going back who faked images of ufos probably put them onto glass and they would hold them in front of the camera and then you could you know it project the actual image and it would look like it was a ufo in in the distance or whatever but, you know, using Photoshop, you can enhance and see the detail. And also, um, one good case to put that to, really, was the um, the famous battle over Los Angeles, 1942, where it was um, a large craft was seen over Los Angeles, and it was fired at by um, artillery shells, etc. It had the spotlights on it. And because all the spotlights were on this object, it was highly illuminated, so you lost a lot of detail in the photographs. And I just basically tried to find the most original photograph I could. And when I run it through the analysis, you can see in the first book the detail that came out in the craft. And, you know, nobody's ever done that before. You actually see what the craft looked like underneath, and it was, you know, pretty unique. Wow. Uh, so now, where do we go from here? Like, what's, what, what do you um, plan on doing now? Are you going to keep writing books? You said you've got a speaking tour. Uh, what's next for you? Um, well, speak. I've only given one talk before, and that was via Skype through the ESETI Ranch, uh, through uh, James Gilliland, um, and really getting into the public side of speaking is probably the next step. Um, which I haven't sort of haven't done really. Um, I've just worked on some footage, uh, one of the cases I covered of an Argentinian pilot. Um, he was actually buzzed by two UFOs, and he caught the footage on his mobile phone. Um, I, I mean, I first came across this footage during 2014, 
uh, while researching my first book, The UFO Photo. And um, it was an unnamed veteran Argentinian pilot, um, and he'd actually witnessed other UFOs um, on separate occasions, but he didn't have a camera with him at the time. So he decided to, you know, take his mobile phone with him. And in 2014, the camera on a phone was okay. Not like today, you get 4K and 1080 and really high definition footage, but it, you know, it was okay at the time. And he was basically uh, flying on a, a straight transit. You can actually see the footage. You can see the low cloud base around him. He's probably about five to 10,000 feet, um, you know, flying on a, a straight, steady transit forwards you can see the propeller turning in the front uh, through the front cockpit and um, basically you, you could see him slightly look to the right hand side and a elongated craft a large craft buzzed right in front of his aircraft followed by a smaller craft and then they flew to his right hand side where they formed up together and then did uh, a, for, a tight formation flyby right in front of his aircraft again before it took off um, and I think I've just done the footage for the American show I think it's paranormal caught on camera and I think it'll be aired on the first episode of, of that series uh, second series but it's all in the, the book and you can see on my uh, UF only Facebook page uh, YouTube page, sorry, you can actually see the footage for yourself on there. Hmm. No, so I was going to say that. Do you have a website, or uh, what? What places can people go to watch your uh, uh, YouTube's and and uh, things like that? Yeah, if if anybody ever needs to contact me, if they need uh, any images analysing, or you know, they just want someone to confirm something for them, I'm happy to do that. They can contact me on. Um, my UF only uh, Facebook page um, it's on Twitter etc um, and I've also got a UF only um, YouTube channel where the videos uh, there you know you, you, obviously larger videos that you can't actually put on Facebook so there had to be a YouTube channel so you can link them together um, yeah you know so if anybody you know, needs any help with anything, I'm, I'm willing to help them. I don't charge any money for to do any of this. I never have done and I never will because I do believe that everybody, you know, whether you've got money or you haven't got money, you should have all be on the same playing field when it comes to finding out information. Okay. So now your book is available, I guess, at uh, Amazon and um, and you could probably order it through bookstores. Um, we're gonna yep. ha we're gonna have this on our website as well, so listeners can just go one click and pick up the book while they're listening. Um, again, now the book is called "The UFOlogy Umbrella: Close Encounters Are Not Enough," and the author of the book and our guest has been Jason Gleaves. Thank you for taking the time with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.